Hey everybody, uh, we're really glad today to welcome uh, somebody I'm just getting to know. Uh, they came on high, re high regard and high recommendation of my good friend uh, Walt Seibert. So I'm just going to read a little bit, share a little bit about uh, Segundo Velasquez, who's our speaker today representing Mano a Mano. Born and raised in Bolivia, he and his family moved to uh, moved into the city there during the agrarian revolt in 19 around 1952 struggling to stay afloat economically the family finally put together uh, enough money to purchase an old truck with a water tank attached to its bed at, at that time he happened to meet Joan Swanson Peace Corps volunteer one day when she was struggling to carry water up a hill it was a chance meeting their encounter turned into a lifelong friendship and eventual love and Joan and Segundo are married today uh, Segundo immigrated to the United States, attended college, and spent 35 years working for Northwest Airlines, ending up uh, in his uh, retirement role there was a vice president of the maintenance area. He and Joan married along the way, and in 1994, at the request of one of Segundo's brothers, Jose, a physician in, in Bolivia, started collecting surplus medical supplies here in the States. Their first shipment was 500 pounds in 1994. Last September, we shipped over 90,000 pounds of medical supplies to Bolivia. I'd say there's a little bit of growth there. He and Joan built a, also some of their work with Mano a Mano. They built a six-story compound in Bolivia where um, each family member has a floor for living space. Plus, it is a home for uh, Mano a Mano's uh, arm for building and construction that they have there uh, over in Bolivia. To date, uh, Mano a Mano has built 195 medical clinics They've built 50 schools, seven point, uh, they've built seven $2 million gallon water reservoirs, and plus many pounds, many, ooh, many pounds and 100, oh, and 100, many pounds of medical supplies, and uh, probably about 100 greenhouses for growing. So we're going to listen to a very humble individual uh, who's accomplished a lot. We welcome, uh, Segundo, we welcome you, and Walt. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. I have to correct some of those figures, but, but we will do that. Uh, um, thank you um, for this opportunity to uh, talk with you. Thank you to Stephen Barato and this club for inviting me to uh, talk with you about the work that Mano Mano is doing in Bolivia. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, 23 years ago, I never would have imagined, in, imagined that here I would be in front of you talking to you about the work that uh, we're doing. Uh, it was a simple idea that we started with. It was just in response to this need that we were seeing in Bolivia uh, and how to help them. Um, so I was, as you said, I was born in Bolivia to poor peasants that worked uh, the land to make a living. And Walt, if you would uh, hit that uh, for me. Um, <clears throat> so the, the child that you see on this uh, uh, picture is really what I did for my father when I lived in Bolivia, leading the oxen team as he hoed his fields with an a uh, wooden plow and, and an oxen to uh, earn an income for my family. About 45% uh, of the people in Bolivia, of the 10.5 million inhabitants, live in the rural areas doing subsistence, the farming. And the people uh, also are living in these uh, humble dwellings of adobe structure with thatched roofs. Um, and 94% of them are living below subsistence level, as defined by the World Health Organization, the inability to afford a healthy uh, diet. Also, the World Health Organization uh, states that Bolivia has the highest rural poverty in the world. Now, I believe, even though I don't see some of the pictures that I see in other parts of the world um, of people dying on the streets, if I may say that, 
But I think what ha what's happening in Bolivia is that most of the people that are living in the rural areas are all poor. And so in that sense, they're all really just uh, making ends reach to be able to uh, um, make a living. Basically, in the rural areas, they're bartering to, to live. Communities will come together to uh, advocate for, their, for the things that they need and that they will work hands-on with us to uh, work on these projects that Mano Mano uh, puts together. Bolivia uh, is a landlocked country in South America. Uh, it's located at the heart of South America. Um, Three major cities of Santa Cruz, La Paz, and Cochabamba are joined together by one two-lane road going from one end of the country to the other end. So as I said, we were, uh, I was very fortunate to, to work for Northwest Airlines. Um, and uh, also, as you know, uh, Northwest uh, or airline employees get passes. So I was very fortunate to travel often to Bolivia. And every time that I traveled to Bolivia, family members, friends, and others would always would be asking me to purchase this or to bring this and that. And so I would do that. When I traveled to Bolivia, I would see the tremendous need. And when I came back here, I would see the surpluses that we have. So my wife and I talked about how can we respond to the needs that these people have in Bolivia and uh, increase their capacity to serve the poor. Simple idea of collecting surplus medical supplies from our hospitals, nursing homes, daycare centers, our garages, and so on. Um, at the beginning, really, it started with just a handful of instruments that I collected from a friend of ours, a medical doctor, who gave me these instruments. And I took those to Bolivia. and turned it over to a medical facility that was helping the poor. But that handful of instruments for my second trip had turned into a full carry-on, and I hand carried that also. For my third trip, it was enough to fill a full suitcase, and it was two, four, eight, and on one occasion, I actually hand carried 28 excess bags of medical supplies to Bolivia. And today, we're actually shipping 40-foot containers of cargo to Bolivia. This is the cargo that would be ending up in our landfills here in the US. Instead, it is going to uh, help those in need. And it really, as they say, it makes the difference between life and death for them. All of their cargo with the volunteers are picked up and brought at the beginning to our house. Right here, we're at our house because we didn't have an office. The cargo and the medical supplies would be stored in the bedroom, and the bathroom, and the kitchen, and the basement, and every, every place else. And here, we are sorting the supplies in our basement with friends and uh, family members. If it was nice outside, we would do it outside. And then we would also pack these items uh, outside on our, um, um, literally, uh, just uh, on the grass. Uh, later on, friends and their children joined us sorting med uh, school supplies, which are also collected. Instead of those school supplies ended up in our landfills, especially when it comes to the locker cleanup days, uh, the children are collecting them, and then they turn it over to us, and then we ship it to Bolivia, and then turn it, uh, distribute it to rural schools and school children in the rural areas. As I said, in this particular picture, we're actually storing the medical cargo outside and on the uh, driveways because we really didn't have the, the money to, um, for a warehouse facility. And it didn't matter if it was snowing outside, if the opportunity came to ship, we would ship. And for a long time, actually, we took advantage of a program that's called a, a Denton program, D-E-N-T-O-N, named after Senator Denton from Wisconsin, 
that introduced legislation to our uh, Senate that permitted our military aircraft to transport humanitarian cargo on military aircraft on a space available basis. We've shipped millions of cargo, pounds of cargo with them. Uh, and today, again, as I said, we're shipping uh, with containers. On this particular slide, actually, we now have a small warehouse and office facility in St. Paul on Pierce uh, Butler Route. And a group of Rotarians from Robbinsdale, New Hope, um, are uh, packing medical supplies with us and along with staff and Walt and, uh, and uh, other volunteers, we filled four 40-foot containers. And that cargo arrived in Bolivia. Uh oh I was putting the final touches on this <laughs> container to, to go. One more, Walt. Um, and that cargo arrived in Bolivia about uh, a month ago. And this is actually the cargo in our warehouse in Bolivia. And there, too, volunteer doctors, nurses, individuals are sorting through the cargo that we send. Again, millions of pounds of medical cargo, uh, brand new in many cases, uh, in most cases, they're not expired or even close to expiring. But for m many reasons, this cargo becomes um, surplus in, in our country. Sometimes it is the liability issues. If the pack or a kit maybe has been dented or damaged and the, and the facilities don't want to take chances, they will surplus it out. Maybe here uh, a particular provider um, changes providers and the new stuff that's in the warehouse becomes surplus and they don't know what to do with it and it becomes surplus. Well, all of that cargo is picked up and then shipped to Bolivia. And on this particular slide, uh, over 24 public hospitals in Bolivia are picking up the cargo that was uh, prepared for them. Uh, it is a very public um, event. The representative for the health minister is present. Mano a mano uh, board members are present and then the representatives from the 24 hospitals picking up. Um, they will pick up in the vehicles that they have, and it might be uh, pickup loads, boxes, and uh, truck loads, or individuals that will also come to pick up, pick up the crutches, walkers, prosthesis, limbs, uh, wheelchairs, and so on. Anything that in many cases here that gets thrown away they can use it in Bolivia and many other places, I know. Um, over a hundred wheelchairs that were distributed also. Uh, and I have to say, there was a group of uh, Rotarians from California, actually. There were therapists that traveled to Bolivia uh, to also fit the wheelchairs to individuals that were uh, receiving these chairs. There was a young individual, uh, 18 years old, who um, uh, had, uh, you know, couldn't walk. He, uh, he had to be carried every place that he traveled, paralyzed, uh, paralyzed fully, and uh, he had to be carried in his family member's arms. And that's how he came to Bolivia. First of all, they rode a bus for 18 hours, uh, and then he was carried in into the uh, Mano Mano facility. But when he left, as my sister said, he left on a limousine of a wheelchair because he couldn't even bend to sit in a wheelchair, so they actually had to make up a kind of a gurney-like wheelchair for him. Mano Mano also uses the medical supplies that we send uh, on the 155 medical facilities that we have built in Bolivia. Uh, some are hospitals that are 37 bed hospitals. Others, like this facility, that have um, rooms for the medical doctor, the nurse, the dentist, birthing room, examination room, 
uh, education room and so on. But there they are uh, cared for patients and the supplies that we send are also uh, used by the medical staff um, on births and individuals. I know I wanted to show you this one because there was a group of people in South Dakota that actually uh, make uh, little layette kits for children. They will go and um, buy clothing, sometimes from Goodwill, and they will combine beautiful colors and send uh, uh, these kits. These are made available to uh, mothers that are going to, uh, they're going into labor and they're encouraged to come into the clinic to deliver their, their children. And they're offered this kit if they come in to deliver their children in the clinic. After they have delivered, I understand that the nurse will take one of the pieces, like the blanket out, and will say, if you come back for your follow-up uh, checkup, then you will get this one and complete your kit. So they will do um, anything that they can to make sure that the people can come into the clinics to get uh, the care that they need uh, and also so that the children are vaccinated. Mano Mano also has built uh, uh, schools, over 55 schools. The projects can be quite large, from 24 classrooms uh, along with 16 housing units, bathrooms attached with it. In this particular case, it looks like we have a facility that built uh, four classrooms, housing units, four, four housing units, and a bathroom to the right. Uh, that would be one project for us. Um, but 55 that we have built in, in 55 communities. Uh, I mentioned that uh, school supplies that are donated to children in the rural areas. It's the books, notebooks, crayons, pencils, uh, and everything else that we pick up here uh, that are then given to these children um, uh, to use in their uh, work. Rotarians, is, uh, both in the St. Paul uh, Rotary Club and uh, Duluth and uh, uh, Superior Clubs have partnered with us, um, as well as the Robbinsdale Club to ship uh, over 50,000 pounds of medical cargo, uh, build four water reservoirs. I didn't say much about the reservoirs, but they're very large uh, facilities that provide uh, irrigation and drinking water to over 40,000 people. It's the water, Bolivia has a rainy season and a dry season, and if you don't have a way to catch the water, the water will run away, so the reservoirs allow people to hold the water for the dry season. We've also constructed medical centers uh, with the Rotarias from the Duluth Superior Area. And then today we are partnering on building a road uh, 12 miles long that will connect a small community, a town, onto a main road. Just being able to take the, the produce, their produce, to a larger city market will double their income. I was very fortunate to be in Bolivia for another road that we built, which was 60 kilometers long. And the people were grateful for the road. And they said to me, as a result of the road, everything that we purchase today costs us half it used to cost us before. And everything that we take to the city, we can sell for twice what we used to sell for before. But the best thing is that because now we know we can uh, transport our cargo to the city, we are producing four times the amount that we used to produce. And that's the kind of uh, development that we really uh, is wonderful to see in Bolivia. Um, volunteer opportunities, it would be wonderful if the Bloomington Rotary Club could partner with us in volunteering, sorting, packing, uh, the cargo and getting it ready. Um, maybe sponsor the transporting um, medical cargo, one of those 40-foot uh, containers. Travel to Bolivia with us. We transport, uh, I mean, we travel with Rotarians and others. Um, and in this particular case, Rotary members, both from Bolivia and the U.S., 
are participating in the dedication of a school that was built. Um, and there's a very, very, very uh, large celebration that takes place because people are really grateful for these projects that create opportunities and make it possible for their children to be educated or for, as they say, now that Mano Mano has built a, a clinic, our wives and children will not die. That's what we are working uh, and making possible uh, as we partner with the Bolivians in, uh, and, and the community that we live in here. Um, Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, we have some literature in the back. We, actually, there were a couple of books that were written about Mano Mano. Um, and this particular picture is on the face of one of them. It's called La Familia. Um, but uh, and if you have any questions, maybe I can answer them for you. We have so. a few, few moments for questions if somebody has them. Please. Do you have any, did you have any issue with customs bringing in all this equipment into the country, uh, or was there corruption where they would try to, you know, ask you for money or whatnot to get it in? Actually, we have had very, very little problems at all. Um, one of the things that we do is that Mano Mano staff, uh, actually the Mano Mano U.S. Uh, helped create four Mano Mano organizations in Bolivia, each one focused in their area of expertise, health, education, agriculture, and aviation, and so on. Um, and we are pretty much in control of all the equipment that we send, in control of the resources, manage and execute the projects. Uh, we're actually, Mano Mano actually owns, for example, the Caterpillar equipment, and so we hire the people, we train the people to execute these projects. So uh, in that way, our corruption is zero. Um, and we have a very good working relationship with the government. Uh, first of all, the government has to partner with us, um, contributing resources, uh, funds, literally. In some cases, it was up to 45% of the cost of the project. So they're definitely eager to partner with us and to work with us, uh, and we do not participate in corruption issues at all. So. Other questions? OK, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Stay up here a moment, if you would. Thanks. All right, just uh, you know, as, a, as a little bit of a, a token of our appreciation for you coming today and speaking at our club, uh, our, our club will uh, put a donation uh, toward the End Polio Now uh, program through, through Rotary. Wonderful. And uh, uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about that. It's a signature project of Rotary International. Um, it started in the early 1980s, uh, started before that, but 1980 there was about 400,000 cases of polio in the world. Uh, each year Ro Rotary is dedicated to join with other organizations and lead toward that eventual eradication of polio. Uh, we're getting fairly close to that. Uh, they, they were, uh, we have had 14 cases so far in 2016 in basically Pakistan and Afghanistan. And at that this same time last year it was 23. So we are making some progress toward the end. So uh, again, uh, if you look back even to 2015 or 14, it was 74 cases. So you can see that transition of, of that. So success is, is coming our way on polio. And with that, I'll give you a little certificate that just acknowledges that we're going to do that. Put that in your Wonderful. name. Wonderful. Thank, oh, so thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.